And welcome to Capital Talk, a program we hope will have an impact on the future of Kenya. Now more than ever, I'm Jeff Kinangi. Now we're continuing this theme we've been telling you about all this week on the bench, ex-presidents. And yes, we have come to the Intercontinental Hotel here in Nairobi, in their gardens, to interview yet another former African president who's in town on a very important mission. What a man this man is. Imagine dedicating your life to a movement since the age of 14. That's exactly what my guest here has, did. Joining the ANC at that tender age all the way to now. He just turned 70 a couple of months ago. For many years, he was considered the face and the voice of the ANC. He worked his way all the way up the ladder to deputy president. And then when Nelson Mandela made good on his promise to serve only one term, he stepped into those big shoes was president for nine and a half years and folks even after leaving the presidency still working he's a man who will be credited with coining both the NEPAD the new economic empowerment for African development and also African Renaissance insisting that the 21st century belongs to Africa still working folks he's here for a higher level meeting on illicit financial flows from Africa he'll tell us about that and will also take a walk across the continent because he is no doubt a true Pan-Africanist. Two words, folks. Sit back. Former South African president, my good friend, Thabo Mbeki. Mr. President, good to see you as always. Good to see you too. Welcome back to Kenya. Thanks. <laughs> so you're here as part of a panel, high-level panel on illicit financial flows from Africa and those numbers are astounding what I'm hearing something like 50 billion dollars a year that's correct the uh, <clears throat> that's that's the estimate that uh, the the continent is losing every year that that 50 billion dollars exported out of Africa illegally uh, and of course as you can see the uh, and then you'd have a figure for overseas uh, development assistance, the aid, mm -hmm. which would be 25 billion a year. So we lose twice the volumes of money that we get as this aid. So um, it's obviously a critical African problem because it impacts neg negatively on growth, uh, negatively on foreign exchange uh, that our countries have, uh, on tax revenues for governments, uh, intensifies levels of corruption, it's got a pervasive negative impact like that, so it has to be addressed. Yeah, but, but Mr. President, it goes both ways, doesn't it? Those people accepting the funds on the other side, they're also to blame. Sure. <clears throat> no, when the monies leave Africa, they go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we are an exporter and there's a, somebody there who receives. So uh, what we have to do as a panel, our panel task of the panel is to try and uh, identify the sources of this this illegal outflow, how it is done, where the money comes from and where it ends up, in order to be able to say to the African governments, these are the practical measures that you should take in order to address this problem. But let's face it, Mr. President, it's not ordinary people who are sending money outside. It's the same, a lot of the same people who are in power. It's, it's a lot of the people who are in power working together with a lot of the people who've got the money to export. So indeed, yes, I mean, you are dealing with, uh, with powerful forces, whichever way you look at it. Because the ordinary person does not have $15 billion to export. They, they wouldn't even have uh, money perhaps to buy bread. So um, yes, indeed, you, you are dealing with these large flows necessarily mean the involvement by people who are, are very important in, in the politics of the continent, in the economy of the continent. Is there a political will then? Is, do you, where do you get the will from when it comes to high level? Well, I, I think the, the fortunate thing is that uh, the, the panel was established at a meeting which was a, a meeting of African finance ministers. It was a continental meeting. Finance ministers, ministers of development planning and so on a meeting together with the UN Economic Commission for Africa. So in fact the decision originated from the African finance ministers because given, well, given, given their work as finance ministers, they, of course they can see the seepage. They can see what is happening in their countries and uh, were concerned enough to say, look, let's set up a panel. 
So uh, that signals that at least there is somebody uh, in the, within the system of, of African governance. There are some people there who are concerned, so concerned enough. Well, one would hope that, that that concern which was shown by the finance ministers would, uh, would spre spread throughout our governments. Uh, I was going to ask about hope. Is there hope on top of all this? Because it looks like you're climbing majorly uphill here. Well, you know, we had uh, <coughs> a, a meeting uh, today, the 14th uh, of August, had a meeting with uh, the, the President Wai Kibaki, uh, who came with the Foreign Minister, with the Permanent Secretary, at Treasury, at Finance, and so on. Uh, and a very good discussion. And indeed, uh, uh, we were asking to, to engage the government of Kenya on these issues. Uh, and indeed, we're very, very pleased uh, with the positive response. And immediately, uh, even a contact point where our panel should, to whom should it reach out in order to access all the relevant people here, central bank, the tax authorities, and, and all of that. Yeah. So that, that was a good response. This is the first time we had engaged in any of the African governments directly now as a panel to say, look, we'd like to work to, with you along the following lines. Mm -hmm. And I hope, I hope that's a signal of what's going to happen elsewhere on our continent. Yeah, and even if we're not, we don't expect 100% you know, to climb down on this, even if it's 10, 20%, that'll make a lot of difference, It'll wouldn't it? It'll make a lot of difference. We, we must aim, we must aim to really to deal with this matter in a, in a decisive way. Indeed, you are quite correct. It may be that in the practice, we don't succeed as, as well as we want to, but we must succeed. Yeah. Speaking of succeeding, Mr. President, Sudan, that's a country you've been going in back. You probably have the most air miles to go, <laughs> to go into Juba and Khartoum. How is that situation right now, Mr. President? There's a lot of worrying, worried people out there thinking that the, the two Sudans are going to go back to war. No, no, they, they will not go back to war. Uh, I'm quite convinced that both of them have had sufficient experience of war to know that none of them neither side will gain anything from going back to war. No, we, at, this, at this most recent meeting, uh, uh, the, the African Union Peace and Security Council, which is our boss, they've given us up to the 22nd of September uh, to submit our final report and said that in the event that there are any of the matters on the agenda which have not been resolved by then, uh, we then, as the, as the panel on the dealing with this issue, should then submit proposals to them as to how they, the African Union, should deal with these matters. So if, if the things are not concluded by, by the 22nd of September, they are saying the African Union will then take the decisions as to what needs to be done. Yeah. And in the meantime, there are skirmishes back and forth, ABA, I mean, that whole oil area. It's still a huge bone of contention. No, but uh, <coughs> you see, the, uh, one of the things that was resolved now, uh, not long ago, in fact on the 3rd uh, of August, was a matter which had been very difficult, which was how to handle the export of South Sudanese oil through the pipelines and the infrastructure in Sudan. Uh, that matter was resolved, all of the, the monies that uh, are supposed to be paid and the conditions and all of that was decided. So that was a very major uh, step forward. Uh, it's a very, very important uh, agreement. It has a, a particular consequence uh, about which both sides agree. we we'll come back to the matter that we're raising about the possibility of war. Because both sides are saying it is therefore obvious and logical that you, you couldn't have uh, South Sudan resuming oil production and export in terms of this agreement I'm talking about yeah. in a situation in which there is war because then somebody will bomb the pipelines. So the, that very agreement on the oil thing to resume production and export means then you've got to make sure that the security circumstances exist for that to happen in conditions of peace. Mm. So uh, even on that matter of peace. In fact, all of the major decisions, all, all of the major decisions that are required to address the issue of peace between the two countries, all of them have been taken. Including the borderline? That's one issue. <clears throat> the only issue that remains is to decide uh, what is the, the, because they've decided on the matter of a, of a demilitarized zone. Uh, 
That's agreed. And what you do in terms of uh, monitoring and so on, and indeed even the monitors, monitors have already, are already in place. They are all together. Um, what is remaining is a decision of w what is the center line uh, of that demilitarized zone. A and in that respect, the government of uh, South Sudan have accepted fully what our panel proposed as that center line. So the only thing that remains is for the government of Sudan to do the same, accept that center line. As I say, everything else that is, all the other decisions that you need in order to ensure that uh, there is peace between the two countries, all those decisions are taken. You are only waiting this one decision, which must be taken between now and the 22nd of September. And the DMZ will be controlled by the AU troops, is that it? It's a joint, uh, the, 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 the monitors and, and so on, uh, the, uh, both governments, Sudan and South Sudan, supply the uh, same number of monitors each. Then they, uh, they are joined by an international team of monitors. Then the security arrangements, in fact the leadership of the whole thing, is handled by uh, the UN forces in, in ABA. That's the second mission they were given. Uh, this UNISFA, uh, it's a UN force. So they are leading this thing and then they will supply the international monitors, supply the protection force, supply the helicopters and all of that. So it's in fact a UN mission done jointly with both countries. And you're hopeful that things will work out post the 22nd? I'm saying all of this, <laughs> you see the, they were saying for instance, all of the monitors, they are actually at the same place together now as we talk. They are ready to move. Uh, the helicopters are ready, all of that is ready. And uh, we, we, it, it's of course, uh, it's, uh, it's the Sudanese government has had a difficulty uh, accepting this. But we continue to engage them. And the particular problem they had was that they, uh, they interpreted uh, the center line for the purpose of separating the armed forces of both countries. They, they interpreted it as uh, being uh, the final border between the two countries. Now both the African Union and the UN Security Council have now said quite repeatedly that they would like to reassure both governments that this has nothing to do with what will be decided between the two countries as their permanent border. This is entirely a security line and uh, must be implemented, implemented with that understanding. And unfortunately, um, so there's a particular area about which the government of Sudan are concerned. Uh, because this center line, they are saying that, no, this where you've put the center line, there's a lot of territory south of that center line, mm. which you are handing over as Sud South Sudanese territory. But I'm saying everybody's saying there's no such thing. Uh, this is a center line entirely for the security purposes. Now, I'm saying that fortunately, the government of South Sudan, which according to this suspicion by, by, by Sudan, yeah. would be the beneficiary Correct. of this territory. They themselves in writing have said, we know very well that this, is not, this territory is not being given to South Sudan. It's entirely for security purposes. So we, we, we think it shouldn't be too difficult yeah. to overcome this one problem. Hmm. Mr. President, I want to talk more about that after the break. And also the fact that you yourself coined the phrase African Renaissance. And you also were quoted as saying the 21st century belongs to Africa. Do you still feel that way? Is Africa rising now? Or there, are there still pockets of those so-called basket cases that uh, the West is so quick to call some of us? And also Kenya, an election around the corner, Mr. President. This, I guess this is the prize for this region. And we have to get it right. Your thoughts, Mr. President, after the break. We're talking to one of the smartest people I know, folks. What a pleasure to have former South African President Thabo Mbeki on the bench here at the Intercontinental. We're talking to former presidents all this week. This one you need to listen to. So don't even think of touching that remote control because you know the bench is back in a moment. And welcome back to Capital Talk. All this week we've been talking on the theme, former presidents. They've been in town with very important messages and on very important missions. 
like my guest today, former South African President Thabo Mbeki. Folks, here for a high-level panel, high panel on illicit, illicit financial flows from Africa. Up to $50 billion a year, believe it or not. Time to get some of that money back. Time to talk things Africa. Two words, folks. Sit back. So, Mr. President, you coined that phrase. You, you, you're well credited with African Renaissance. 21st century belongs to Africa. And it looks like there are a lot of, there's a lot of green out there, a lot of hope out there. And African countries are really showing themselves off, if you will. Is this what you need? Yes, you see, the, uh, <clears throat> I, I think uh, one of the things, uh, Jeff, that is very, very good and very inspiring is that uh, that message about the 21st century being an African century and that this really is in our hands. Uh, really what makes me very happy is that it's quite clear that this message was heard, was heard by the ordinary people on the continent. So uh, <clears throat> you find it wherever I go on the continent, this is what the ordinary people are saying. I'm not talking about their political leaders, I'm talking about the ordinary people across the continent. Uh, very, very strongly feel this. And, and I think that's very, very important that uh, you got that ownership of that perspective by, the, by these ordinary billion Africans. It, it's very good and I think it uh, obviously puts a bit of pressure on the political leaders. But there are certain things, of course, which are positive, which are happening. We've just been talking now about, uh, about this challenge of resolving problem between Sudan and South Sudan. I, I think what is one of the things that's been outstanding about this is that in reality, if you take the last 10 years, uh, this is the, the one challenge of peace, stability, democracy, all of these things uh, on the continent that's really been handled exclusively by the Africans. And you have this very, very interesting situation that everybody, I'm talking about the biggest powers in the world, uh, including the United Nations and all these people. On this particular one, the first point of reference is the decisions of the African Union. Everybody has accepted that the Africans have insisted that what we've been saying all the time is correct and necessary. And that's what you envisioned, mm -hmm. African solutions that's, that's to exactly African problems. What that, exactly, and that is part of how we take charge of our destiny. So I'm saying that it's very important that this matter is evolved in the way that it has. And of course you see these other positive developments and everybody talks very strongly now and approvingly uh, of what's happened to the African economy in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, sustained higher rates of growth than, than, than ever before in the past and, uh, <clears throat> and clearly uh, it's taken root it's not a, a temporary matter a particular blip uh, so, so I think this is part of this process I think you have some other decisions that have been taken which need follow up which need implementation yeah. uh, take for instance African politics you raise this matter about the forthcoming elections in Kenya. Yes. Uh, it, it obviously is a very important matter and, and has to be an important matter, particularly after the experience of the last uh, presidential election. Uh, uh, no doubt this is a matter that, uh, that has to be attended to. Now, <clears throat> the, at the beginning of this year, the, 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 the African Union, well, let me say, the charter uh, of the African Union the Charter on Democracy, on Elections, uh, Governance, uh, was, was ratified. It's in force. I'm mentioning that because I think that then gives the... Uh, so it's approved. This is Africa policy. Uh, this gives the possibility to the institutions of the African Union, and particularly the Commission, to intervene. Not just to come and watch, to monitor elections, because that Charter says... Uh, African Union Commission has a responsibility to intervene in countries in the elections to ensure that they are peaceful, that they are free and fair, and all of that. So it's not a matter of coming day before the election to come and monitoring how it's going to be done, to come in early to say what are the conditions and then all of this. And I would imagine that in this particular case, given our experience uh, here in Kenya last time, 
the, the commission would want to do that. Certainly that's what I would say to them. It's important that you must use this instrument, which is constitutes African policy, to, to indeed go and work with the Kenyans yeah. to make sure that this is, this is achieved. It's important because of the importance of Kenya, apart from any other consideration. Uh, of course, what happens here, it reverberates uh, around, around the continent and surely. So it means what goes right in Kenya also reverberates across the continent. Yeah. So got to make sure that things do go right. On that point, Mr. President, I have to ask you about this question about the Hague International Criminal Court and its presence, especially on the African continent. It looks like this is where it kind of, it's just case, Africa is the case study for the ICC. That's what some people say. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, my, my own view about this all the time has been that, you see, we, as an African continent, we, we get faced with certain challenges. You, you go to a country, let's take, for instance, what uh, happened in the Congo. A war breaks out and involves a whole number of countries, Rwanda and Uganda, then, and then and others coming on the side of the Angolan government, uh, Zimbabwe, Angola, etc. So our first task as a, as a continent would be to say, let's stop the war. Uh, and then once you succeed uh, in, in doing that, to stop that war, you must then say, what is it that we do to make sure that it doesn't recur? Uh, and then we have to say, uh, in the case of the Congo, for instance, uh, what do we do in order to solve? It was not only a conflict between the Congo and the rest, but also conflict within the Congo itself. Uh, uh, how, what do you do to end that internal war, uh, etc. Now, <clears throat> and these are critical things that you have got to do uh, on the continent in order to secure stability, uh, institute democratic systems, ensure uh, uh, national reconciliation, all of these things. Now, <clears throat> obviously, uh, in terms of addressing some of these issues, you've also got to say, but there are issues of justice that arise. Uh, some grave offenses might, might have been caused, which you can't just pass over. Uh, what do you do? I mean, you take, you know, this South African example very well. The same issue arose. We need to end apartheid and then all of that. Uh, but you can't this issue, uh, uh, ignore this issue of, of the justice factor. But because we're handling this thing ourselves, we took the decision also how then do you handle the justice thing? It was handled in a particular way. And, and uh, people might have complained that we didn't take people to court and so on. Of course, the ICC was not there then. Uh, but we didn't uh, take no, declare and say, charge him or any, anything like that. Because if we had done that, then we would have lost the peace. Lots more people would have died. Now, <clears throat> You then get somebody who's sitting at The Hague uh, whose only preoccupation is justice. And when you say to them, but uh, sure, we understand very well uh, that justice needs to be done. But what about the other things that are connected to it? You can't say, uh, uh, I'm, I really, I need to get a sit down with Jeff Koinange to come and sit and make peace to make sure that our people stop killing each other. And then they can turn around and say, arrest him. Uh, because then you are not going to get that peace. This matter about justice in the context of the resolution of our conflicts is best dealt with by ourselves uh, on the continent. And, and it may very well be that uh, the decisions we take uh, are not necessarily decisions that somebody in, in Europe or America and so on will approve of. But we are the ones who need to decide what's wrong, what's right. And uh, uh, <clears throat> you know you know how destructive the, the apartheid res regime and the apartheid system were. This is the only system after the Second World War that was formally by an approved convention uh, declared a crime against humanity. So, so these are, in, therefore, in terms of that, these are criminals. The people who led the system are criminals, by definition, in terms of a con convention. 
But I'm saying we didn't take them to court. And the whole world approved and said it was a miracle. Why is it a miracle? When we go that route in South Africa and not a miracle in another African country where the manner in which you handle this thing uh, helps to resolve these this larger problems. So uh, I, it's, it's a matter of great concern, the manner in which uh, uh, the ICC has intervened. But of course, I think we must also admit that uh, in many of these cases, if not the majority of them, these cases have been referred to the ICC by ourselves. Uh, and when they say that, that if you take the cases arising out of the Congo or Cote d'Ivoire and even here, mm. even here in Kenya, yeah. uh, these, the, these things were referred to, to them by us. But hopefully people will, will learn a lesson. And you know you get some absurd things. Uh, because in terms of the Rome statute, of course, there is also this role of the UN Security Council. Mm. You've got three of the five members, of permanent five members of the security, who are not the signatories to the, to the Rome Statute. It, they don't recognize the, interna the International Criminal Court, but they sit there and, and recommend other people to go to the International Criminal Court when they are saying that they will never allow that they are citizens uh, are treated in that way, because they do, we don't recognize this court in that process. It's an upset thing, but it's happening. Makes no sense. It makes it well. It's, it's it's no sense at all. But it's it's a reflection of the injustice in the system of international relations. I mean, the United States, the Russians, the Russian Federation, China. If a, if a matter like that comes up in the Security Council, they ought to recuse themselves. But no, they don't. They sit there and approve the, and approve decisions. You know that the, the African Union, a long time ago, go quite correctly, said with regard to the resolution of the conflict in Sudan and the conflict between the two Sudans, you need President Bashir as a player to assist in producing the peace that we need. And I've sat with the, the, the President of South Sudan many times, the President Salva Kiir, and he will say, my principal partner for peace is President Bashir. And because it recognized that the AU went to the Security Council and said, look, uh, what you need to do, use whatever clause in all of this Rome Statute to defer this matter about uh, charging and issuing warrants and all that uh, of President Bashir because we need this outcome. And they didn't say withdraw the charges. They said just defer uh, this thing. And they refused. Double they refused. Yeah. The same people who are not uh, signatories. Double standards. And, and go around the continent threatening people, the same ones, yeah. uh, who go around the continent to say, no, I will see the way your people are behaving. You must be aware we'll take you to the National Criminal Court. Double standards? The double standards. Even probably worse than that. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a very contemptuous way in which you are dealing with our continent. Mm. At 70 years old, Mr. President, do you get tired of all this? I mean, uh, <laughs> you're on the road, you're on the run, you're up and down. I mean, do you, does it tire you? No, 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 I mean, the, uh, there are important challenges on the continent. And uh, I mean, you, are an, you and I are Africans. 100%. Uh, you might be a, a Kenyan African and me a South African African, but we're African. Yes. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, one always feels very strongly uh, the need to to engage with these challenges, which are our, our challenges. It doesn't matter which, what the national boundaries are. Uh, these are our challenges. I mean, I'd I'm, be concerned about uh, the, the, the forthcoming elections in Kenya. And I'm absolutely sure that uh, as, as NGOs, uh, these non-governmental people, yes. we will, will say something and do something to assist to make sure that this. So you can't get tired. Uh, I mean, if... Uh, if my own people in Kenya are killing one another, you can't get tired of saying, what the hell do you think you're doing? You can't get tired of doing that. The struggle continues. <laughs> it does. A luta continua. Okay. And you just mentioned yes. an African. That speech of yours still resonates. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> well done, Chief. Well Thanks, done. Jeff. Good to see you. All right. Former South African President Thabo Mbeki. And speaking of, I am an African, Google it. Listen to that speech, folks. It is.
will wake you up. This man, one of the smartest I've ever seen on this continent, still fighting for one billion Africans out there. And he's 70 years old, folks. What excuse do you and I have? What a guest, what a show. What a week it's turning out to be, folks. It's former president's Tabo Mbeki, no doubt, up there with the best and the brightest. You cannot find guests like President Tabo Mbeki anywhere else, but right here on the bench at the Intercontinental on the award-winning station, K24, where we are. Yes, indeed, you guessed it. Even in times of I am an African, we are still all African. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. This particular edition of Capital Talk has been recorded at the Intercontinental Hotel, Nairobi.